to illuminate the text, Father, to help us to understand your word and your revelation so that we can apply it to our lives and that we can be changed by coming into your presence and knowing you deeper, Lord. I, I pray that, that you would bring about a greater joy in our life, Lord, that joy of knowing you and living for you, Father. Please, Lord, just move us this morning as we, as we desire to, to know you more. triumphal entry, which is the next day. Right? So they have this blowout party. Lazarus is on display eating with everybody else alive. Jesus is there, not hiding. And Mary's anointing him as their king and as their savior. Um, and the next day, we see him going to Jerusalem. Right? So the event of Jesus' triumphal entry is important because it reveals Jesus' kingship and it fulfills prophecy. Jesus was worshipped during the triumphal entry. Because people were proclaiming the sign he did in raising Lazarus from the dead. And it seems because of the reputation of his ministry. The triumphal entry is also important because of the symbolism of their worship. The palms represented Jewish nationalism, and Hosanna is a phrase meaning, save us now. The waving of the palms, combined with their cries, showed these crowds believed him to be Messiah. And they were begging him to act on who they believed him to be. Now, the irony here is they didn't understand how his ministry was to play out. Looking back on redemptive history, we can see he did just that, and he did so very weak. Right? He, he saved them, and he did it that week, but it's not the way that they were expecting. This text also quotes from Psalm 118. So, in opening up this morning, I just wanted to read through that whole psalm so to prepare us as we go into the text in John. So we're going to be in Psalm 118 right now, 1 through 29, if you're following along. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let Israel say, his faithful love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his faithful love endures forever. These are the priests. Let those who fear the Lord say, his faithful love endures forever. I called to the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and put me in a spacious place. The Lord is for me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is my helper. Therefore, I will look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in nobles. All the nations surround me. In the name of Yahweh, I destroyed them. They surround me. Yes, they surround me. In the name of Yahweh, I destroyed them. 
They surround me like bees. They were extinguished like a fire among thorns. In the name of Yahweh, I destroy them. You pushed me hard to make me fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He became my salvation. There are shouts of joy and victory in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand performs valiantly. The Lord's right hand is raised. The Lord's right hand performs valiantly. I will not die, but I will live and proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord disciplined me severely, but did not give me over to death. Open the gates of righteousness for me. I will enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I will give thanks to you because you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord. It is wonderful in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. Notice there, they're crying out for God to save them. And then before they can even, before the words are even off of their lips, they're already proclaiming the fact that he has. Lord, save us. And then he who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God and has given us light. <clears throat> Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. <coughs> so today's text is John 12, 12 through 19. And in this text, the people were croning from this psalm. And their praise of Jesus as he came into Jerusalem. They were welcoming the Blessed One into their city. Let's read today's text in John about Jesus' the triumphal entry. The next day, like we said, the next day after they had this party, after that Jesus is, is there and they're proclaiming that Lazarus is alive, and Mary's anointed him as her king, he has the smell of the anointing on him, right? The next day, when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna! He who comes in the name of the Lord is the Blessed One, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written. Fear no more, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Meanwhile, the crowd, which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. This also is why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done this sign. Then the Pharisees said to one another, You see, you've accomplished nothing. Look! The world has gone after him. They're a little frustrated. So first of all, let's just talk about the palms. Right? Here, here he's coming into the town. They hear that he's coming. And so their first reaction is that they go get palms. And they greet him with palms. Right? Why palms? What's the significance? Now in the intro to today's sermon, I briefly stated that the palms were a symbol of Jewish nationalism. But where did the practice come from and what did it signify? journey back in redemptive history to Leviticus. In Leviticus 23, Yahweh was giving Moses instruction of how to celebrate the Holy Festivals. And in verse 40, he instructed a practice of gathering palms and rejoicing before Yahweh. So this was a method not only of rejoicing, but in worshiping Yahweh, the, the personal name of God, specifically. Right? So in Leviticus 23, 40, it says, on the first day, you are to take the product of majestic trees, palm fronds, bows of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and rejoice before the Lord, your God, for seven days. 
right? So their praise of Jesus like this also mimics what prophesy says all creation will do when he returns. Looking at Psalm 96, 10 through 13, it says, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. And anytime you see it capitalized like that, it's Yahweh, right? The Lord Yahweh reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. He judges the peoples fairly. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and all that fills it resound. Let the fields and everything in them exult. Then there are the trees of the forest who will shout for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. For he is coming to judge, judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his faithfulness. Or Isaiah 55 tells us, when the king comes back for good, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. So here's what's happened. Jesus had just recently raised Lazarus from the dead. And the word is out for better or for worse. The Pharisees want to kill him. And everyone else wants to worship him. Right? That's what's going on here. The people are talking about it. And the Pharisees want Jesus dead at this point. They've planned it. And everyone knows they've planned it. We know this because the text tells us. Back in 1153, they had plotted to kill him. And in verse 55 through 57... The people who had gone to prepare for the Passover are asking if he will become because there's a warrant out for his arrest. What's Jesus do? He has a blowout party with his disciples, putting Lazarus on display. Right? Giving further proof, Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Then, as he talked, as we talked about last week, Mary anointed him at this party. Now here, we're at the next day. They prepare to worship him. They grab these palms, and they go rejoice before Jesus. They praised him as Messiah, and they worshipped him as Yahweh. They worshipped him the way that the Jews worshipped Yahweh, with these palms, right? So the next question is, what about this word, Hosanna? They're praising him with these palms, and they're yelling, Hosanna. We just read about this back in, in Psalm 19. It didn't totally work in there. <laughs> it's kind of what it looks like. All right, so we don't do this often, but we're going to have a little study lesson on ancient languages real quick. Right? Here we're reading through this text, and we have this exclamation, Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one, the king of Israel. Now we understand the bulk of that sentence, right? They're saying, he who comes, Jesus, they're looking at him, they're praising him, he palms, in the name of the Lord, they're saying he's coming in the name of the Lord, is not just blessed, but he is the blessed one, right? The Messiah. And they also call him the king of Israel. Not just any Messiah, not just any savior, like the many God had brought through the redemptive history, but the one, the promised one, the king who would reign over David's promised eternal kingdom forever. That is an amazing statement, guys. They're proclaiming towards Jesus. But what is Hosanna? Why is it important that they used it here? Now, in the English, we have the word Hosanna, right? And if you go to the Greek, you're going to find, guess what? Hosanna. So, so literally, when they took the Greek to the English, they just ascribed English letters to the Greek sounds, right? Um, but if we dig deeper... We're going to see that the Greeks did the same thing to this Jewish, this Hebrew word, right? They literally, they just went back, and, and they just made it sound like that as well. They didn't translate the actual word into its meaning. They just used the word Hosanna. So, wanting to get at it in the Hebrew, the word is, the Hebrew phrase is Hosa, save us, and na, now, please. So it's literally, it's a phrase, not just a word, it's save us, now, please, Right? Now, the word hosa, or hosiah, is used 29 times throughout the Old Testament. But this word used this way is only used once, and it's in one, Psalm 118, 25. And here, the save us is sandwiched between an introduction of now please for added emphasis. So it's literally now please, save us, now please. They're desperately begging for this, right? In the Hebrew, it says, Anna, Yahweh, Hosa, Anna. In English, 
Now please, Yahweh, save us, now please. The text they're quoting uses God's specific name, Yahweh. They leave out the personal name because, the, because by practice they didn't use God's name for fear of using it in vain. Right? A lot of times they would just take out the, the vowels and have Y-H-W-H and not say Yahweh. Or they would just say, or even as we translate it, we translate it as the Lord. Right? Because they're so afraid of using the name in vain that they just stopped using his personal name. And, and so they're quoting this when they're screaming this out to him, right? They're, they're quoting Yahweh, save us, please, Yahweh, and they're pointing to him and saying, he is the blessed one. He is the king. This is him. And they're worshiping him as God, as divine. So that, that goes right along with how they're using it here, right? From the house of Yahweh, we bless you. Now, in John, instead of saying, he who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed, like I, like I just said, I jumped in my notes, they say specifically, he is the blessed one. Which one? The king of Israel. And they, they explain it in their, in their statement. Right? So literally, it's like they're saying, save us, Yahweh, save us now. Blessed is him. He is the blessed one. He is the king of Israel. He is who we've been waiting for. So at Hosanna in the beginning of the phrase, we see that they're, they're crying out to Jesus as their Lord, Yahweh, asking him to save them and blessing him as the one, the promised king, the fulfillment of the covenant, the fulfillment of God's promises, right? And they're, they're praising him and worshiping him as he's coming into the town, right? So we have, we have these words. We also have these symbols, right? So we have the palms that are a symbol. We have another symbol we're going to talk about here. We have this donkey's cult. Right, so they're praising him as king, and he's riding in not, in, not even on a donkey. He's riding on a donkey's colt, on a baby donkey. What's going on? Right? You would expect like some fierce warrior to be coming in on a great steed. or You know what I mean? But he's coming in on this donkey. So we have this other visual aid in the text. Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on the colt of the donkey. Right? So again, let's look back in, in redemptive history. Let's look back in the Old Testament and find out what's going on here. So Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious and humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Their king is righteous and victorious and humble. Not your normal king. Right? So now we can see just in this verse that the riding on the foul of a, or a colt of a donkey was a specific sign that Jesus was fulfilling prophecy, that he was the king of promise. This also points out that the Messiah, the promised king, would be unlike any other king. He would be humble, seemingly meek. But let's read the whole chapter to get a better context of what's going on here. Let's, let's read Zechariah 9, this oracle, the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach and Damascus. It is its resting place. For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord. And also against Hamath, which borders it, as well as Tyr and Sidon, though they were very shrewd. Tyr has built herself a fortress. She has heaped up silver like dust and gold like the dirt of the streets. Listen, the Lord will impoverish her and cast her wealth into the sea. She herself will be consumed by fire. Ashkelon will see it and be afraid. Gaza, too, and will write in great pain, as will Ekron, for her hope will fail. There will cease to be a king in Gaza. A mongrel people will live in a shab, and I will destroy the pride of the Philistines. I will remove the blood from their mouths and the detestable things from between their teeth. They, too, will become a remnant for our God. They will become a clan in Judah. He's destroying their enemies, but he's making them his own people. He doesn't just destroy them. How does he destroy them? He, he takes away that which makes them impure. Right? And he makes them a remnant. Just like there's a remnant of Israel, there's a remnant of the other nations of the world, of their enemies. And Ekron will be like the Jebusites. I will stand, I will set up camp at my house against an army, against those who march back and forth. And no oppressor will march against them again. 
For now I have seen with my own eyes. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed, and he will proclaim peace to the nation. His dominion will extend from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of your covenant, I will release your prisoners from the waterless cistern, return to a stronghold, you prisoners who have hope. Today I declare that I will restore double to you, for I will bend Judah as my bow, I will fill that bow with Ephraim, I will rouse your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece. I will make you like a warrior's sword, then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will fly like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and advance with the southern storms. The Lord of hosts will defend them. They will consume and conquer with sling stones. They will drink and be rowdy as if with wine. They will be as full as the sprinkling basin, like those at the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save them on that day as the flock of his people. For they are like jewels on a crown, sparkling over his land. How lovely and beautiful they will be. Grain will make the young men flourish, and new wine, the young woman. So the humble king of promise has come. He was promised to be a humble king. They weren't expecting it. They weren't paying attention. He has come, and the expectation was it's all good. This is our moment. That's what they're thinking. He's here! Yes! We're free! It's going to be good. Goodbye, Romans. Yes. Right? We'll be free of these Romans. Back to the good old days. Right? But the truth was, they were not intended to go back, but forward. Forward to something better. You see, the covenants, God's promises with his people were progressive in nature. All relating to each other, building on each other, and moving the redemptive narrative along to its fruition. You see, the end goal is not one earthly nation ruling and being better than the rest of the world, to which the rest of the world is jealous, but to bless the world through a nation and redeem people from every nation back to an intimate relationship with God in a new garden, in a new garden city where God will dwell with them intimately as he did in the original garden. So the kingdom is not of this world, but about redeeming the world. Also, the king is not of this world, and so his kingliness will not resemble the worldly kings. Jesus came as a meek king, not to save his people from their earthly circumstances, ultimately, but to save them from themselves. Their true enslavement, enslavement was not Rome, right? But to the sin nature they inherited from their ancestors in the garden. So let's talk about this idea of the victorious king being a meek king. Jesus himself talked about meekness in his Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. Now when we think meek, for some reason, we often think weak, right? However, the Greek word used for meek was praus, meaning mild, tender, gentle. It was often used to describe a wild animal that had been tamed. So you could think of meek as power under control. However, that paints a different picture than what we have here with Jesus. He was not tamed. He made himself meek. He restrained his own power and chose to come in the form of a servant. He poured himself out into a human, right? He poured out his full divinity into a human vessel in order to serve and save his people. So the idea of meekness is not what we think of when we ponder the idea of a savior or even when it comes to being a man, right? Often in years past, I've pondered, what does it look like to be a man of God? Is it a warrior like David or Samson or a wise man like Solomon or a bold man like Paul who gets stoned and goes back into town and continues preaching the gospel? What does a godly modern-day man look like? Often, growing up, when I thought of, like, the Christian man, I would think of Flanders from Simpsons. <laughs> right? 
He was kind of nerdy. He's got the pocket protector. He's got my Bible. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Um, and that's not the, the picture at all, right? When thinking about meek in this way, they'll cast things in a different light. Sorry, I moved on there. Um, it, they, they seem weak or out of touch and kind of a weirdo, right? But we want to think about meek the way that the Bible tells us to think about meek. We want to think about it the way that the Jesus is explaining meek. So when we think about it this way, it casts a different light. One was Samson the strongest, right? Would you even dare to ever think of Samson as meek? And the end of his life, he was weak. He had failed, right? They had put his eyes out. He had strayed from God and was being treated as a fool to laugh at. A mere trophy for the Philistines, right? Then he wasn't meek. Then he became meek in his prayer, right? He surrendered to God. He repented. He realized, I'm here because I jacked this up, right? And he asked God for his strength back. Not for himself. He asked him for the strength he realized God had given him in the first place, right? So that he could surrender his life to give God the glory over the Philistines. He asked God, give me the strength back so I can use it the way you intended me to. To glorify you, not me. Right? And what's he do? He gives his life to glorify God. He doesn't go out and break the chains off and start fighting people. He pushes the columns apart and brings the whole place down on himself. Right? He gives his life to glorify his father. His, his God. Right? And not only does he defeat the Philistines, but he also saves Israel, right? Neat picture in the Old Testament pointing us to the gospel. He was meek. He wasn't weak. It took a lot of strength and resolve to give up his own life for everybody else. So a similar prayer there for us that we could pray would be, God, fill me with your strength because true strength only comes from you. And take my life, right? All that I have and use it to bring you glory, not me. Because I live to glorify you. The created exists for this purpose. Jesus himself, who is God, also came not to glorify himself, but to glorify the Father and redeem his people back to him. The true king is a lion and a lamb. Right? He conquered by dying to himself. We also will be conquerors in the same way, by the same method. We will conquer sin and death through dying to ourselves and being made new by the power of the Spirit because of what he did on the cross for us and not believe us. Right? It's going to be hard. And dying to ourselves, we're saying, man, I enjoy this thing in my life, but it doesn't glorify God, so I need to stop it. Right? I, and I can stop it because I have the Spirit of God in me. I can be confident. I can be bold. I can do this. I can have victory because he is victorious. Right? So now going back in the text in verse 16, we're again given as a, a, a note from the narrator, right? And in 12, 16, it says, his disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. <clears throat> so John was referring to the waving of the palms and the shouts of Hosanna, all these things just mentioned in the text. He's moving us along, telling us about the event. We have continued to see these kinds of notes in this series as Jesus was progressively revealing who he was and what he had come to do to, to his disciples. They declared rightly who he was, and he said, shh, it's a secret. He reveals who he, who he, he is the human expression of the tabernacle at the transfiguration of Matthew 17. Then again says, keep this quiet until I've been fully glorified. Right? Here we have a note that though all these specific signs and actions are occurring, his very disciples didn't put it together. Not then, but later, after the work of the Father had sent Jesus to accomplish was finished. Right? This teaches us something very important about the text of Scripture and its revelatory function. Right? You see, the event itself was not the revelation. And now we have written word pointing to the event. Right? God's revelation is not behind the text, where we can get to it from another source. God's revelation to us about who he is and what he has done is in the text itself, right? You see the Spirit guided these men, empowered them to understand these events, 
and see how they related to past revelation that inspired them to record these events through the historical bias of the Spirit. What we have in the text is what God wants us to know. It is God's message to us about what happened and why. We can look back and have confidence about who Jesus is and what he's done for us because of the text and its explanation of these events. Right? The text continues to speak to us because the Spirit inspired it to be written, and the Spirit continues to illuminate the text and help us to understand it. But the text doesn't change. Right? God's Word has been revealed to us through the apostles, through the prophets. Next it says, meanwhile. Right? So it's like, so all this stuff is happening. Break! The narrator says, by the way, at the time the disciples were actually kind of oblivious as to the depth of what was going on. But don't worry. They get there later. Right? Meanwhile, the crowd of people who had been there at Lazarus raising from the dead continued to testify. These people are testifying about who he is, right? Though they didn't have full understanding to everything that was going on, they were sharing what they knew about Jesus. They were praising him and proclaiming his worth to others. This praise of Jesus is also why there was a crowd in the first place. Right? Check that out. What drew a crowd of people at this point? Proclamations of praise about who Jesus was and what he had done in the life of someone they knew. There is some application for us right there, guys. First of all, they saw God do something amazing among their group, and they didn't keep silent about it. They were excited about it. We know what Jesus had done for them was important because they shared it with others. That is something we need to be doing. We need to appreciate the things God is doing in our lives and show appreciation not by keeping quiet about them, right? And the amazing thing about this, as we see here, God uses that to draw others. And the amazing, as a church, we can rent the greatest building, we can put together the most amazing worship set, and we can strategize programs and methods all day long, but what draws the crowd to Jesus is the proclamation of him. Not us, not whiteboard strategies, right? The proclamation of the gospel and the sharing of what it's done in our lives. We need to share what God has fixed, healed, restored in your life with others and watch God do miracles in the lives of others around you. This is the most miraculous thing God does, is bring people to new life in Him. And you have a part in starting a revival in your family among your friends, and your neighbors, and your co-workers, and your classmates. You just got to open your mouth and talk about Jesus. We end this text with the frustration of Jesus' opponents. Love this end point. Everyone's bragging about what Jesus has done and is doing, and the result was more people were flocking to him. And those who did not have a relationship with him were angry. They were angry because they wanted the attention. They wanted the control, but they were losing. You see what was happening here was spiritual warfare. We think of spiritual warfare as exorcism, like we see in the movies. But we find in Scripture that spiritual warfare is much more of a normal everyday occurrence and done primarily through evangelism. Going back to the garden in Genesis 3.15... We're reminded that there would be the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman who would do battle. And the seed of the woman would be victorious, defeating sin and death, the serpent, right? Now this speaks to the Messiah and his battle against the devil, but it also speaks to the two sides of the war, right? All those who have a relationship with Jesus are the seed of the woman, and those who do not are the seed of the serpent. Multiple times throughout Jesus' ministry, he referred to the Pharisees as a brood of vipers. And he used serpent language. Right? Also, we saw in 1 John, as we studied this, this summer, all who do not have a relationship with Jesus are antichrists. Right? Those who oppose Christ and those who know and love him are considered God's children. So how do we engage in this war? We proclaim the truth of Jesus and what he has done. We evangelize. And what God 
God to do and watch God do miraculous work of changing hearts, turning serpents into children of God, bringing dry bones to life. Right? Paul was adamantly against the church. He was killing them. He's asking permission to go chase them down and kill them more. And he's it talks about him in an animal-like language. He's ravaging the church. What happens when he meets Jesus? Something like scales falls from his eyes. Right? God destroys his enemies by changing them into his children. It's amazing. And we get to be part of that. How? By opening our mouths. By proclaiming the gospel. And being transparent. This is what it's done to me. Right? This is... I'm still just in need of grace as anybody else, but the gospel, right? And, and so, man, I jack things up. I'm broken. I'm still in process. I'm less broken now, and, and hopefully, progressively, I'll be less and less broken and more and more like Christ as I walk with him, and I desire that for you, too, right? So let's close again with Psalm 118, 1 through 29, and think about this psalm Christologically reading it. Think about how it points to the Messiah and what he does. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. His love doesn't give up. Let Israel say his faithfulness, his faithful love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his faithful love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his faithful love endures forever. Not just Israel. Israel, their priests. Everyone. Right? God called Abraham, and he said, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing to who the whole world. It's not just about Israel. It's not just about us. It's about blessing others. Right? I called to the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and put me in a spacious place. The Lord is for me. That's an amazing truth. Right? He's for me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me. Right? The Lord is my helper. Therefore, I will look in triumph on those who hate me. I'll be confident. I'll be bold. Because the Lord is for me. I call to the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered. I just read it again. <laughs> it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in men. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in nobles. All the nations surround me in the name of Yahweh, I destroyed them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me in the name of Yahweh, I destroyed them. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguishing, extinguished like fire among thorns. In the name of Yahweh, I destroyed them. You pushed me hard to make me fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. There are shouts of joy and victory in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand performs valiantly. By the way, who's the Lord's right hand? Jesus. Tells us later. The Lord's right hand is raised. The Lord's right hand performs valiantly. I will not die, but I will live and proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord disciplined me severely, but did not give me over to death. Open the gates of righteousness for me. I will enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter into it. I will give thanks to you because you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus. This came from the Lord. It is wonderful in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, save us. Here's where we're going back to the Hosanna, right? Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. It's going to happen that week. Jesus is going to be the sacrifice. You are my God and I will give you thanks. You are my God. I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let's pray. Lord, you are amazing. Thank you that we can have access to you, Father, because of what you've done for us. Thank you for loving us. 
and saving us. Most of all from ourselves, Lord, from our own depravity, from our evil desires and passions and, and trying to find fulfillment in the creation instead of in you, the creator. Lord, I pray that you would just stir our hearts up in love for you. I pray that you would guide us to, to just worshiping you deeper with all of our lives, Father. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to gather together in your name and um, change us, Father. In your name.